congratulations on this incredible work. This is very much my cup of tea. I, I love the art of conversation in films that allow words to steer the narrative. So before we dive a little deeper into those words, my curiosity first takes me to the conversations you had with your cinematographer in finding the right visual language to match the verbal one. Obviously, you turn the saturation down, but there's also how the camera moves about the room when these women are talking. Sometimes it completely moves around them. Sometimes you choose to focus on the emotion of the speaker, and other times it's the emotion of the receivers. Could you give me some insight into that and figuring out the organic math involved in shot placement? Thank you for the question. No one's asked me that, and I really appreciate it because it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, so in terms of the saturation, I knew from the beginning that it couldn't look real in any way. It couldn't look documentary. There's mm -hmm. a sense of a fable about this film, both in terms of the concept of it and in the dialogue. Everything about it is heightened in some way. I was really curious about the notion of a faded postcard time that's passed. You know, I think by the very fact that these women entering this loft and having this conversation about how they're going to change their world one way or another... They've already consigned the world they're in at that moment to the past. I wanted there to be set this sense of nostalgia about it and the sense of timelessness and of a world that was already gone. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the camera movement, that was a really kind of intricate or innate process that took place over, you know, a year and a half where mm -hmm. I kind of went through the script. I sort of, you know, usually I kind of shot list things in a linear way and with this film I sort of began with the turning point so I began with the moments where I felt there was a really genuine emotional shift right. in the room and I didn't want to hold I, I wanted to be very intentional about those moments visually and not just sit back and rely on the actors I really wanted there to be a sense of choreography and movement around that room and so mm -hmm. I began with those pivotal moments and then I worked between them in terms of building up to each one. So that might look like focus rack. It might look like an axis shift. It mm. might look like a push in, but that we were never sitting back and being shy about when the very delicate, complicated dynamics in that room changed, that there was, there was a language for it visually. Sure, sure. I just thought about it because you had that great line about putting frames around things and how they spill over the edge. So I just thought a lot about that. Oh, thank you. But uh, I also found it extremely poetic how you mostly leave it to the audience's minds to fill in the violence. There's that great line about within the gaping silence was the real horror. Mm -hmm. And I, I know the original novel cuts straight to the existential questions too, but could you talk about what that meant to you when you originally were reading that, carrying that over into your adaptation and the power that the aftermath can have over the event itself? Yeah, I really appreciate it. So it's funny that you mentioned that line of the in that gaping silence is the real horror. That's a line that was written very late in the process. So mm. at around three months into the editing process we changed the narrator from August who's taking the minutes to Auche the youngest woman in the room yeah. and then I had to go through a whole other writing process where I I kind of rewrote from her point of view and wrote that narration and that was I think that notion is something that came from very deep within me just that feeling of not having language for things I think that's something we've experienced as a society certainly that you know when we suddenly have a collective language for something it makes the processing of our individual trauma um, much more accessible and mm -hmm. doable and possible. And also sort of thinking about and getting to know a community like this one and how much isn't spoken, you know, how much isn't said and how you live with those things in silence um, and what happens when they're brought out of silence and the power of that, especially when it's done in community. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's quite clear that poetry was a, a big influence on this film with both the writing, the inclusion of actual poetry in the dialogue, the images. I believe we see two young girls braiding their hair together like a symbol of unity. And there's that great scene about commas and comma butterflies. So I, I'm curious how much of your own absorption of poetry and like how much did you include in this film outside of what Miriam included in the text? 
I really appreciate that. I, I, I mean, I feel like the first thing I wanted to be was a poet when I was a kid. So I do feel poetry does inform a lot of the way I want to work with images and, and text. I think also there was a sense in terms of the voiceover when we went back to it and, and I was really re-examining it and looking at it, where it became clear that the voiceover had to be doing something parallel to, but not directly connected with the images. And so there needed to be kind of a conversation in a space between the words and the images where people could kind of fill, fill it in with themselves and their own perspective. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. There, there's something to be said about the, the line about something worth living for in this life and not always putting focus into the next. Does, does a, does a work like this cause you to think more about how you're living your life now and not necessarily what life holds for you down the road? Like where, where does a line or a theme like this kind of carry you? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's really stuck with me that's from the book and it's in the film is that verse from Philippians of, you know, whatever is good, yeah. whatever is just, whatever is excellent. Um, think about these things. And I've really carried that with me, you know, as a kind of North Star. I really think there's something about the idea of looking for the good that can come from a situation or a way forward or what areas to be treasured has mm -hmm. become a really important guiding principle for me. And I think especially when working with topics that's difficult, I'm always interested in the way through things and and where those sort of more traumatic, harmful experiences can actually aid you in your ability to see and to empathize and to work out a meaningful way forward. I think that I've spent my whole career for the most part going into really difficult subject matter. And I'm less interested now in mining those depths without some sense of possibility at the end of it, or not just hope, but like a practical way through to a better possibility. Right. Right. One of my favorite parts of the film is a statement Ona says about the innocence of a young boy before ideas are filled in, into their heads. And she's she even says something about having love for her attacker when they were at that point in their lives. And then you visually articulate this by using the beautiful music over the images of young boys in the classroom as they nearly stare right down the lens and into your soul during this during this time when you can still see the the wonder in their eyes or it's a transitional point that kind of sets up the path for violence and i i think it's i think it's the moment in the film for me and it, it was so powerful could could you talk about approaching those moments and what it meant for you and what sort of conversations it may have sparked on set or before production began. Mm -hmm. The first clue I think is from Miriam where in the book she has a male character that's very central to proceedings and it's, he's a deeply good man. And mm -hmm. I think that's like, you know, the first hint at how I wanted to approach it in terms of conversation around men because Obviously, these women are trying to process incredible harm that was done to them in incredibly brutalizing, horrible, violent ways. But we know good men can exist. We've all met right. them, hopefully. Um, and I feel like that's the important conversation um, to have is 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 how do we get how do we get more of those? And like, how are we raising boys? And how are we raising? people of all genders in terms of what to expect and what they can expect of each other. I I, I believe genuinely that people are deeply good and mm -hmm. um, we get sort of corrupted and screwed up in all kinds of ways. And obviously we have enough stuff um, along with that goodness that we can easily become people who do harm. But my sense is, if you want to think about it, because it's a really good question. I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm, I've never been convinced by the idea of evil or badness in any way. I think there's a difference between evil and what society aids and abets. And I think that um, the harms that have been done, so many of them, yes, they're, you know, we are all responsible for our own actions, but we're also in a society that raises us with certain expectations. 
And if those changed, I think we'd, we'd see enormous change in terms of the number of people who, who do terrible things. So my gut is that, you know, when we see the faces of those boys in silence with that music, is there's tremendous danger and there's tremendous hope. Yeah. And it's really up to us which way that's going to go. Yeah. Like as a, as a broader world and society, not just up to those those boys and their individual choices. I mean, I right. think we are just, we are products of our lives and our env environments and what we've been taught. And um, I think there's enormous possibility in that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was really well done. I, I hope you're proud of it, Thank you. but um, we're keeping that conversation going as, as I watch this, we see that, you know, it's a different point in time from now and a different way of life, but you can see how these collections of moments could exist in the present, such as the comment about smoking and drawing attention to yourself, maybe how people comment on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably a terrible example, but you can probably catch my drift. Mm -hmm. it, it it just goes to show you how this story and the words it it, it says, unfortunately, kind of skips across this the sea of life. Is that is that something that was popping up for you throughout the filming of this? Like, if this was shot in the modern era, it would look like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the line that you brought up specifically makes me think a lot about how people can people who have been hurt or harmed in the same way can judge each other for the responses that they have. So yeah. maybe it's about feeling like you weren't allowed to or given the space to fall apart. And so seeing someone else fall apart feels like a slap in the face. So I think that, you know, this is a problem in any community where people have been harmed is that there can be this kind of lateral violence of judging each other's responses to something. And certainly, you know, the internet, that doesn't make that easier, right? I mean, we do a lot of judging how people are processing and shifting and exhibiting symptoms of having been harmed, even if we've been harmed that way ourselves. I mean, it's a very easy way to sort of sit back and pass judgment on each other. But I think what I'm, what I really love about the women in that hayloft is they make, even if they don't like it, and even if they rail against it, they are ultimately making room for a huge, diverse set of responses. The trauma. Mm -hmm. And they kind of, they, they understand that some of them need to rage and they understand that some of them, you know, are paralyzed. And those, there are these moments where they don't understand that in each other. And, and those are the moments of real dissonance in the group. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to, I know we're about to run out of time. So I want to close out on two uh, quick questions that kind of get to know you a little bit more, but I, I love the, the simple pleasures in this film, like such as the early scene of, you know, the women washing their feet, uh, that support system throughout is really beautiful. Um, who, if I may ask, who is a part of your su support system? Who keeps you above water and your roots in the ground? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have really good friends. Um, so I would say, um, I'm married to a really great guy. He's a big part of that. And I have really amazing close friends, both old and, and more recent, but I, I, I mean, for me, that's, that's a matter of survival is like, I'm, yeah. if I'm not doing well. I'm, I probably haven't spoken to a friend recently enough. Hmm. So that yeah. sense of community and, and collectivity for me is kind of everything yeah yeah for sure and as a last one if you had august make up a list for you at the end what sort of things would be on that list um lake swimming poetry mm -hmm. playing with children and a lot of things that are on that list language <laughs> yeah um, wind <laughs> that's a great question i don't want to make that list i might take a while what about you what would be on your list poetry for sure uh nature so all the things that they were describing with the sun and the stars of course my family and things like that but uh movies as you could probably tell <laughs> um so yeah thank you i really love talking to you this is really the highlight of my day thank you so much really it was like such a thoughtful interesting conversation and i really appreciate it